All right, so this morning we're going to do an exercise called creating a model world. The way this is going to work is that we're going to go through it together, and then in the remaining time, you're going to start working on your own um, version for your questions. You have an assignment due at this time tomorrow. So in all of your copious free time, <laughs> you need to be thinking about creating a model world for your own, um, for your own research question. So we're going to continue tomorrow morning with another exercise that builds on what we do today. So it's actually really important that you all show up tomorrow with your assignment completed. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lead you through a series of steps. And each of these steps we're going to do together. I'm going to try to get you to do most of the work. But the process is what we're trying to learn now so that you can then repeat it for your own research question. So the first step. Step zero is what you did yesterday with Becky. I think it was Becky. <laughs> um, so the first step is to focus on a clear, concise research question. We're going to work with an example research question, which is a question that Jonathan and some of his collaborators worked with a couple of years ago. This is really, Thumbi, this is going to be a little bit um, redundant for you. <laughs> um, so you're going to get a lot of help from today's session. So the example question we're going to work with is what level of vaccination is necessary to eliminate domestic dog rabies in Tanzania? And because we're starting out, we're going to try to basically make the simplest model that we can that's going to be adequate for getting a first pass answer to this question. Do I need to repeat the question? OK. Um, what level of vaccination? Write it down since I can't project. What level of vaccination is necessary to eliminate domestic dog rabies in Tanzania? Ready? OK, so that question can still evolve, especially for you guys, because you're um, learning this process. So as you go through, you might realize that you need to modify your research question, and that's totally fine. Um, you might realize it's not specific enough or um, that you're trying to address something that has way too many moving parts. It's totally fine if you end up modifying the question as you go. OK, so the next step is to identify the key outcome of interest for addressing your research question. There might be multiple outcomes that you're interested in. Some of you are interested in you know, what level of intervention is necessary, and then how cost effective is that. But for the sake of this exercise, just focus on one single outcome. Um, and we're going to, for dog rabies, we're going to have presence or absence as our outcome. Um, so other options might be something like the number of deaths per year or the incidence of infection. But because we're asking a question about elimination, we're going to say absence is our goal. We want to know, is it present um, at the end after, after a vaccination campaign or a series of vaccination campaigns? The next process, uh, sorry, the next step is to identify the processes that may affect the outcome of interest. So does anybody have any idea what I mean by a process? Has anyone read the glossary? OK. Let's do a little bit of review. Um, so this is our most basic epidemiological model, right, that we've seen a number of times. What processes are occurring in this model? Infection. and. Where is infection represented? It's represented the long right. So I really should have a dashed arrow here. This process is infection. What other? There's only one other process in this model. What is it? Recovery. Recovery exactly. Um, so our arrows are generally representing processes. It's anything where an individual is moving into or out of one of our 
states or one of our <coughs> compartments. Okay, good. So if I'm asking the question of what level of dog vaccination is going to be necessary to eliminate rabies in Tanzania, what processes might be involved? So this is a brainstorming step, and we're not going to worry about how important the processes are or um, even try to rack our brains for every single possible process that might be involved. We're really going to just try to throw things out that might be important. Um, and I'm going to start picking on people if no one <laughs> volunteers. Um, we do have an expert in the room. I'm going to ask him for one single process that might be important to include in our model. Vaccination. That seems like a very important one since our question is about vaccination. Is that it? Catherine. Susceptible replenishment. Okay, let's, you, you want to call that birth? Okay, great. Any other processes? Jeanette? Can we say outside infection? Outside infection. So importation or immigration or something? Um, let's call it importation. Great. Aunts. Effective immunization, so not just vaccination, but also effective immunization. I like it. Um, I'm going to put them together because they're obviously related. Who can tell me what the difference is between vaccination and effective immunization? Alan? Vaccination. That's the distinction you were making, right? Yeah, okay. Good. What other processes might be important? Let's get a few more on the board and then we'll move on. Um, Sarah? Death, both in the general population as well as disease specific. Great, okay. So, death, we'll call it background. This is how I abbreviate background and disease, disease induced, but I don't want to write it on the board. Okay. Any more burning processes that we should include in our model? <laughs> Not from you. Yeah. Yeah, the, like behavior change, mortality, like behavior change is more zero, so it's not the mortality. Okay. Yes. Um, behavior change resulting in immortality. So is this, um, as, oh, <laughs> yes, that's what I meant. <laughs> okay, um, so we'll call it behavior change. That's sort of shorthand. Um, well, actually, that could mean a couple of different things in this context. So, are you thinking, who, who are you thinking would be changing their behavior? The susceptibles. The susceptibles, okay. Um, so this is sort of in response to seeing what's going around me, on around me, I'm going to do something differently. Um, is there another kind of behavior change that might be relevant in this context? From disease. From disease, right. So rabies can actually change a dog's behavior or any, whatever an animal is, in, is infected. Um, so we might think about both behavior change for the susceptibles and for the infecteds. Okay, Reshma. So, question, what happens to dogs after they get rabies? Can they get treated? Do they just die? Do they get a heart attack? I'm going to let Thumbi answer that. Yeah, I mean, die. <laughs> <laughs> Almost always. Um, but, well, I, yeah, okay. Let's, I'm not going to get distracted by that. Okay. We're missing something, but I think it's covered by importation. I'd like to talk a bit about mixing in the context of Okay, great, great, okay. So let's call it like uh, wildlife contact. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, 
We're going to have a chance to come back to this list and revisit it later. So the next step is to identify the relevant characteristics of individuals in our study system. So remember our research question is how, what level of vaccination is necessary to eliminate canine rabies um, from domestic dogs in Tanzania? That's our question, I think. Um, so what do I mean by relevant characteristics of individuals? So these could be categorical, male, female, uh, et cetera. They could be continuous, such as age. Basically, you should let your study question guide you to the best way to describe um, any, of, any of these characteristics. So for example, um, age is something that you might want to describe as a continuous characteristic, but in some cases, maybe really all you're interested in is categories like children versus adults. Um, so again, this is a brainstorming step, and we're going to write down whatever comes to mind, and then we're going to um, come back to it later and, and try to make sure that we have everything that we need. So let's go back for review. What are the relevant characteristics for our SIR model? If we were just using the SIR model, what are the things that we're using to, to distinguish? We're basically now trying to come up with a list of possible compartments. In the SIR model, we have three character, well, really one characteristic and three types of it. It's infection status, right? So susceptibles who have never been infected, infectious people who are infected right now, and recovered people who were infected before. Okay, so for our system, what kinds of characteristics might we care about? say species. And that could be domestic dog, that could be wildlife. Well, maybe what I was trying to say is, um, you know that dogs are just run around the streets and have no mm -hmm. homes? Would you call that wild dogs? Ah, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so domestic dogs could also be stray versus other <laughs> non dogs with proper owners. Yeah, the, the period um, during uh, which the dogs feed someone and the time they arrive to the center to be vaccinated. Um, I mean, that's not what you're saying. So, yeah, okay, so like, right, so we're, we're, trying, we're trying to say, we're trying to put individuals into categories here. Um, so, so can you reframe that as different categories of dogs? Or of individuals? Individuals. Sorry? What, 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 what was your question? So the question is what types of characteristics, um, so we're really trying to come up with categories or compartments that might go into our model. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can reframe that. So you said, you said that after they get bitten, there might be a period before anything happens. We could call that exposed um, or latent. Uh, let's, let's call it latent. Right. Gotcha. Okay. So a, a lot of people might not know this, this about rabies, but if the bite is very close to the head, then you tend to progress to rabies more quickly than if it's, say, on your foot. Um, so this could vary by um, bite location. So we could have in our model, um, you know, people who have bitten been bitten on the neck and people who've been bitten on their feet. Um, this, th that's good. So we're just brainstorming. We can come up with all sorts of things and they may not end up in our final model, but um, let's see if we can come up with 
a bunch more. Um, Thumbi. Great. Okay. Seems like a good idea since our research question is about vaccination. Are there any other compartments related to infection status that we might want to put in? Previous exposure to rabies. Okay. Um, so, previously exposed. So, with rabies, so rabies is a highly fatal disease. It's it's something that um, I guess that there are. Certainly, um, people, people, certainly people who have been previously exposed um, and have gotten post-exposure prophylaxis and um, have been um, and, and may have a slightly elevated um, immune response. Um, I don't know if that's actually true for dogs, but that reminds me that um, up here where we put species, we might also want to have human, right? Or we might not. What other categories? Yeah. So now we advocate for vaccination for weeks, like how we call it. Wow. But for previously exposed, even for dogs that have not been vaccinated, there's about 3 to 5% that have antibodies. Okay. Okay, great. Good to know. Feel like the back of the room is being, well, other than Lehman, is <laughs> being very, very quiet. Any other categories from over here? John, any, anything to add? I, I, I don't know about the... About the... What, what can I say? The reversion to, to, to another state. The reversion to another state. So is that relative to vaccination? So maybe like loss of immunity? Okay, that's okay. Um, so loss of immunity, you would probably represent that by an arrow out of a compartment. But we can add it to our process list. Um, and then if you were vaccinated and you lost your immunity, what would I call you? Susceptible, yeah. So let's put that on our potential compartment list. Any other compartments we might want to have? So I think you've covered this as a proxy in species, but when it comes to infection, the, the way that they mix, so a domestic dog might be your only dog, whereas a wild dog might be in packs, et cetera, et cetera. So okay. right now species is covering the proxy for what I want to say because they are possibly in three different lifestyles mm -hmm. that will influence their ability to affect others at the moment. So we don't have right. a new thing, but okay. there's something else going on with that. Very okay. That's covering. Okay. And species is probably more what we're interested in for our question. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Um, they, they a stray might interact differently than domestic than a wildlife. Right. Yeah. So I mean that I think that would typically be represented more sort of like in representation of the mixing process. Yeah. Um, but you could also you could think of things as instead of being individuals, you could say, well, let's make all of our wild dogs be packs, and right. and exactly. then maybe. Um, Right. Yeah. Ani? Symptomatic. That's that seems important. <laughs> um, and what do we know about how rabies transmission and rabies symptoms interact? Anyone? Keep looking at Thumbi, but I don't have to. I'm sure I'm sure this is fairly general knowledge. Becky. Uh, so usually when symptoms start happening. Yeah, so those two are, are pretty related for rabies. Um, so we might, might go ahead even now and, and collapse these, but I think we're probably going to want to have some sort of infectious compartment. Otherwise, it's not going to be a great infectious disease model. Okay, um, Christian. Um, I, guess I, I guess I'm thinking about it in a different way. The research question is, 
Domestic dog rabies. Yeah. Domestic dog rabies. And I feel like I'm probably getting this wrong. The SIR compartments, is it for the dog population or is it for the human population? I feel as if if I were tackling that question, I would have two SIRs uh -huh. where I would have SIR for the dog, right. SIR for the human, and I would have a dynamic interaction. Okay. Between. Okay. So yeah, so I don't think you're missing anything at all. I think we do already sort of have that, but let's let's make it a little more explicit. So by saying species um, and domestic dogs, wildlife, and humans, what we're saying is we could have compartments representing all of these things, and we could even break each of these things up into susceptible, infectious, recovered, latent, et cetera. Not recovered for most of them, but um, but yeah. So don't don't. Don't take that SIR model. This, that SIR model is not meant to relate to this exercise. Um, that was just my example of trying to remind everybody what a process is. Um, so I don't know if that's where you got confused. But, um, but definitely, we could represent humans and dogs and wildlife, lions and tigers and bears. We could put them all in our model. We probably don't care about bears because we're talking about Tanzania. But, um, you know, we, c we can incorporate all those different things, and at this stage we haven't made any decisions about whether to do that or not. Um, so that's a, an important point. Okay. I think we've got a good, fairly good list of compartments. Um, so let's move on. And again, these brainstorming steps, there's always the chance that you're going to leave something out, and there's always the chance that you're going to have a lot more than you need, and we'll have um, a process by which we try to figure that out. Um, so. Before we do that, though, I saw some pink chalk somewhere. I don't know where it was. Um, great. Um, so before we do that, we want, I think we would like to go through first and just identify what we think are the most important characteristics and processes. So uh, among the ones that we've already identified for addressing our research question. So how do we do that? Well, one good way to sort of get a clue about what be, might be among the most important characteristics and processes is to think about the wording of the research question and what actually shows up in the question. Um, so just to remind you, thank you, the research question is what level of vaccination is necessary to eliminate domestic dog rabies in Tanzania? Um, and now I'm going to take this list of processes and I want you guys to tell me what do you think are the most important processes on this list? I have a question. Catherine, yeah. What's the timeline between vaccination and immunization? That's a great question. Um, I think it could be better. So, <coughs> yeah. For me, they all look important. Uh huh. <laughs> Just uh, the behavior change. I would say behavior change may affect uh, how humans take care of their domestic dogs. Okay. I maybe it could have an effect on the strays. Let's say if there was a county council who was you know, looking after the streets. I don't know if it would have an effect on the wild dogs. Right. So that's okay. the one where I'm a little bit okay. should be okay. positive. But, the rest but you think that importation, birth, death, and vaccination, and wildlife contact? Well, Okay, so maybe we could treat it as a type of importation. That seems like it might be a good idea. Um, what about loss of immunity? Because dogs don't live that. Do you need to go for a booster? A booster shot of rabies? You would um, vaccinate and you can maintain immunity for about three years, three but they live one to one and a half years. 
So maybe loss of immunity is something we can leave out in this model. So this is, this is something that's important and it's, in, it's really important to sort of have some context specific knowledge because in the US, dogs live for 9, 10, 11, 12 years. Uh, my dogs are going to live forever, obviously, but <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, dogs can live a really long time in some contexts, but in others they don't. And, and so that's going to affect that question of whether boosting is something you really need to be paying attention to. Okay. Um, great. So um, we have a list of our most important processes, and we uh, now we want to get a sense. Maybe I'll just go ahead and, and erase the others. Are people comfortable with that for now? I'll erase loss of immunity. And are people okay with me erasing behavior change? Anyone strongly object? You can always put it back in later once we've understood our mo more basic model. Okay. Characteristics. What are the most important characteristics? Remember, our question is about vaccination to eliminate rabies in domestic dog populations. Susan. Um, for a species, I think I would deal mostly with the stray dogs, uh, domestic dogs, the stray and non stray, and human, not so much with the wildlife because okay. they rarely mix. Yeah. They rarely mix. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm also comfortable removing wildlife from our consideration, um, in part because of what. Jeanette said, which is that we can sort of treat the wildlife as an um, importation that maybe we don't have to include all of the wildlife processes in our model, but we can still phenomenologically allow introductions uh, through some sort of external process. So I like that. Um, do we need human? That's a great question. Does anyone think we need human? When do we spill to dog, for example? When do we spill to dog? The way that human is helpful here is as a spill out of dogs. But yeah, OK. Ani? Uh, I think it's fundamental to the research question because we're trying to basically look at when like, the infect number of infected would go down to zero. Because okay. the target is elimination. So this, this is a really important point. So maybe my research question is not actually specific enough. So I'm going to write it down, and we're going to have to make a decision about what we actually care about. Um, So I've used some shorthand here, but what level of vaccination is necessary to eliminate domestic dog rabies in Tanzania? So what do I mean by eliminate domestic dog rabies in Tanzania? Do I mean in humans? Do, is my goal really to just get human cases that are coming from d domestic dogs below a certain level? Or is my goal to really say there's no transmission going on in the dog population? Those are both valid options. We have to make a decision because that's going to influence. Um, well, but humans interact with wildlife. I mean, so I, I know, you know, I, there are examples of people getting rabies from hyenas, for example. Um, now, but that, Thumbi, would you consider that domestic dog rabies if it's in a hyena? So, I mean, there is a rabies in America that's specific ish to a raccoon, right? It's a slightly different. But, but, we're, but we're in Tanzania, so. Uh, you can get rabies even from bats. But dog rabies, though. No, 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 dog no, rabies. rabies. Okay. Yeah. But, but, but you, would get, you could get dog rabies from a hyena or a jackal. Yeah, if, if a dog bites a hyena, then a hyena bites. Or yeah. Or right, so we have to make a decision here. What's the decision that we want to make? It's about the dogs. Jeanette says it's about the dogs. 
that's my inclination as well, is, is, for, is that for now, maybe it's about the dogs. Now, when we um, start wanting to translate it into policy, um, we're going to need to have that discussion also with the policymakers and, and figure out whether that's okay. But since we're asking sort of a dynamical question about elimination of domestic dog rabies, it seems to me like one very clear answer is that if we can get vaccination to the point where it's actually eliminated transmission in the dogs, then that is sufficient for eliminating the human cases or should at least reduce it way below our tolerable, whatever our tolerable level is, if that's something we can even define. Um, so let's now go back to this question of do we need humans in our model? I see a lot of shaking heads. I, I, I agree. I think we can take the humans out. Um, okay. Good. Um, so, are there any other compartments that we feel like we could eliminate, Alan? I think we probably get rid of bite location, considering average. Yeah, I think that would be uh, a very, very valid thing to do, especially on our first pass of our model. Um, domestic dogs. How, um, how much, how confident are we, I guess, that there's really a distinction to be made here that's important between domestic and, I mean, between stray and non-stray dogs? Sorry? I think there's something there. You think there's something there? Then we, what do you think? Uh, you have a really good sense of a similar context. Okay, yeah, sure, great. <laughs> Sorry, I, I keep asking you and I, I should. I'm speaking in the context where I come from. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people don't really care so much about their dogs. So when they have uh, female dogs they, and they give birth to a lot of uh, puppies, they tend to just leave them go astray. So there are a lot of stray dogs. Um, I think it may be the same thing as Tanzania. It's common to find a stray dog. Right. So I guess maybe another question is, are there really a lot of dogs in this other what we're thinking of as the non-stray dogs. Are there a lot of dogs that are sort of kept at home in their houses and um, being, you know, being regularly vaccinated? And I don't know. Susan might might say say not. Let me. Yeah. Would in, would in humans be good indicators for whether a dog is stray or not stray? And why wouldn't we include humans in our model? Well, because because what we're really considering here is just how we divide up the dog population, and so yeah, sure, it's humans that determine whether that um, that division, you know, what proportion of dogs are are in our stray category, um, but we can represent that just by saying this is this is the reality, um, at least especially when we're asking a question about sort of the current context and the and the vaccination in the current context, and we're not asking a question about, well, if we train people to take better care of the dogs or something like that, which then maybe we would want to think about that. Then we. Now maybe to clarify that, um, when you say a dog is trained, it does not mean it's not owned. Yeah. It does mean it's not confined. In the context of vaccination, I think the question would be, are those dogs accessible for vaccination? Ah. Um, about maybe only one or two percent of the dogs, even though they roam around, are not accessible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's really that's good. So um, we might say that our vaccination um, is limited by the fact that some dogs are not accessible. I think that's a really important point. I also think that maybe that's something we could um, represent other than by saying let's put one or two dogs, one or two percent of our dogs in a completely separate compartment. But we could do that. So uh, maybe instead of stray and not stray, maybe we want to say accessible and unaccessible. Um, And maybe um, we don't actually necessarily even need to represent the unaccessible dogs because it's a fairly low percentage. Now, one thing that we might do is we might, our model might tell us, oh, well, you only need to vaccinate 60% of the dogs, in which case that one or 2% is really not gonna be a big issue. Um, on the other hand, if, it's a, if our model indicates that we need to reach vaccination levels around 99%, maybe those one or 2% are suddenly gonna be really important. Um, 
So maybe that's something that we can do a first pass without the unaccessible dogs as an explicit part of the model, and then we can come back depending on where we think things fall out. Okay, so we've got domestic dogs as our primary species, um, and then our other categories right now are latent. Do we need to keep this in? Yes, no, I heard a no. Who said no? Jeanette. Okay, so that th I think that's a reasonable argument. I think, um, how might we make this decision? So one way we might make this decision is um, related to the different time scales. So how long is a dog infected before they start showing symptoms? Does anyone know? A little while. <laughs> Can we be more specific? <laughs> so, two to a month. Two a month. Two a month. So, I mean, they, but they're definitely going to develop it if they don't get an intervention. Yeah. So, um, so a month seems like a fairly long time, especially if you're thinking about um, vaccination policy, va vaccination that might occur on, say, an annual basis. A month is pretty long <laughs> relative to a year. So. I think there's an argument for keeping it in. We can always take it out and see whether it affects our result later on. John? Okay. <coughs> I'm now a bit lost here. Uh, I just wanted to know by, by that is, are we defending those dogs that are uh, asymptomatic or we are also including those that can be infectious but they're asymptomatic, maybe we call them their carriers. So I, th I think this is the, the sort of exposed but not yet infectious. Is that what, I don't remember who said latent, but. Um, is that accurate? Um, so this is, once they're infectious, we would put them in this symptomatic slash infectious category. And I think for rabies, there's a pretty good correlation between whether there are symptoms and whether um, there is infectiousness and transmission. Okay, anyone want to argue that we should take the vaccinated dogs out of our model? <laughs> no? Good. <laughs> what about previously exposed? Take it out? Everybody okay with that? All right. If you object to anything, you got to be vocal now. Susceptible dogs? Keep it. Keep it. And symptomatic and infectious dogs? Keep them. Keep them. Okay, good. So, so yeah. Okay. I was trying to think no dogs ever recovered, correct? It's, they're vaccinated. To a first approximation, I think yeah. that's correct. Yeah, Catherine. So, at this point, are the species and susceptible categories the same thing? Yeah. So, at this point, we've, we, since we've basically narrowed species down, we've sort of taken this out. Um, we know that we're th thinking about domestic dogs, um, but we haven't divided that up into different categories. So yeah, thanks. Okay, so this step, um, I think, of identifying the most important processes and characteristics, I think it worked um, pretty well for this example. Sometimes it goes terribly wrong. And um, just a few words of advice. If you're unable to select a subset of the processes or the characteristics that you've identified, then you're probably trying to under understand too much all at once, and you might need to narrow your research question. Um, so at this point in the process, as you're doing it for your own research, you should think about whether you need to identify a, a smaller research question that will help inform your question of your broader uh, you inform the answer to your broader research question. So often we want to narrow the focus, really understand something simple, and then build from there. Um, for example, if you, th the other thing is that maybe your question is too vague. So um, if you've asked a question that's like, how does something occur? You might pick a particular component um, that might be part of how something occurs and ask whether and when it can ever sufficiently explain some phenomenon on its own. Um, so I'm going to give you notes. Um, these things will be in those notes. But some of the examples I've used um, 
we've, we've you know, kind of gone off the rails a little bit in this step um, because we are um, really trying to tackle too much all at once and understand too many things when we haven't really understood the basics yet. Okay, so the next step, step five is my favorite step. Um, step five is to reconcile our process and characteristic lists by identifying how the most important processes relate to the most important characteristics. So at this point, we get a chance to sort of revisit things. If we're missing any categories of individuals that are necessary to complete important processes, um, or we have categories that aren't related to others through any of the processes, then we need to make some more decisions and adjust our lists. Um, so the way I'm gonna go about this is I'm gonna take our categories and I'm gonna start arranging them into things that look like compartments in a compartmental model. So um, we have susceptible, we have um, latent, since it's familiar, I'm just gonna call that the exposed class, E. So as I do this, I'll, I can erase these, give myself more room. Um, I have symptomatic infectious dogs. And I have vaccinated dogs. So we've ended up with four compartments in our first initial simple model. That seems pretty good. Um, and now we need to go through our process list and figure out how everything matches up. So as I said before, processes are the arrows in our model. Um, so we have death. We have background and disease-induced mortality. Um, so disease-induced mortality is gonna come out of which of these compartments? I, yes. Background mortality? All of them, yeah. Okay. So we have everything we need in order to be able, all of our compartments that we need in order to be able to, whoops, um, represent death, that seems good. Vaccination process, what is that gonna do? Yeah, so that's gonna take individuals from here and put them over here. So connects S to V. Um, birth. So this is a question. Mm -hmm. um, the dogs that have been exposed, since you cannot tell whether they are rabies, can they also be vaccinated? They could. What would happen if we vaccinated a dog that was exposed? Uh, if it's in time, it's actually protected. Okay, so maybe, maybe it could move here. Uh, is that a thing that, that you think happens well, very often? Uh-huh. If you don't know. If you know whether it has been exposed by because of push and pull bites and that's been visible. Okay. Okay, so so we, we can probably ignore that, but it's a good point. Um, births, where do births come in? Susceptible. Okay, good. That seems sensible. Um, Importation. This is a kind of tricky one. Maybe. Into the infected. Into the infected. Why? Because they're already infected. Yeah, so what we care about is not just the fact that there are dogs coming in, but what we're really caring about when we talk about that importation um, is the, the ones that are coming in with the infection um, and potentially infecting other dogs. Um, we could potentially also think about exposed dogs. It would really depend on the context and how much dogs move around when, they're un uh, when, they're, when they don't have symptoms. Um, but as Thumbi said, if you have a dog and you know it's been bitten um, by a rabid dog, you're probably gonna confine it. You're probably not gonna let it be running around a lot. Reshma. If you have a certain population, you're considering them. So I was wondering whether it just affects the flow, 
from S to E, and you're not actually you don't actually want to count those because then why aren't you counting the susceptible dogs that come into your population? Are the exposed or the vaccinated? Mm -hmm. Why don't you count the infected? Right. Yeah. So that's exactly what we're doing. This is a flow. It's an arrow. That's a process. Okay. So it's just increasing with the effect of infected dogs coming in. Increase the flow of your susceptibles to your Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Um, so, so you're saying you don't want to. So, well, I guess that's maybe sort of a, a philosophical question. If a dog comes in from another area, is it not then part of the the population of dogs in that in the new area in the area where it has come yeah, into? So yeah. Right. Yeah. So one reason for that might be, and, and I think this was in the back of my head, but I didn't say it. One reason for this might be that um, the rate at which infectious dogs come in, like, is is going to be potentially higher because they move around more because they're infectious, and they're, that's part of what a rabid what some rabid dogs do is they actually travel really long distances, so that might be one reason. Um, it also might be completely valid to have immigration arrows for everything else. Um, my guess, my intuition, having built a lot of these models, is that it's going to not really matter very much. Um, and that really, you know, our birth will probably would end up parameterizing births based on actual numbers of young dogs, but increasing it a little bit would be sort of the same as including importation of, of susceptible dogs. And my guess is that our model's not going to be very sensitive to that. OK. So yes? So from that question of importation of susceptible dogs, not that the cancer but the fact that it also be Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a very good point. So if, if the um, sort of dog movement is pretty consistent, then the ones that come in are basically going to be balanced by the ones that come out. And because it's a compartmental model, that doesn't really, um, the susceptibles, we're just going to get as many susceptibles in as they leave, and we don't need to keep track of that. Um, the, the main question there, I guess, would then be, um, do we have really different vaccination levels in different areas? Because maybe we would get an inflow of vaccinated dogs and an outflow of susceptible dogs, and then it could actually change the balance. Um, but that seems like a process that we would want to think about later down the line. OK, thanks. OK, great. So now we've got all of our most important processes. We have all of our most important compartments. Are we done? Do we want to take care of the other half of vaccination? The vaccination. other half of vaccination. Um, so yeah, I'll say a little bit about it. Um, they don't need to have first pass. Sorry? They don't need to have like, first pass, but it would be a little different. So that, that distinction that Ants wanted us to make between vaccination and effective immunization, I actually think probably is best represented as just sort of a modification of this arrow. Um, so like what proportion of the vaccinated dogs actually move from susceptible to our vaccinated compartment, which we want to be thinking of as the protected. Um, and this is partially because my understanding is that when these cam vaccination campaigns are done, they're going to vaccinate all the dogs whether or not they've been vaccinated before. They're not actually saying, oh, you were vaccinated last year, go home. They're going to vaccinate as many of the dogs as they can. Um, so, right. Are we done? Emmanuel? So we need the initial processes moving from S to B and Yeah, we left, some, we left out some really important processes. And this happens. Um, so right now, if we were to write this down as, as a model, we would basically, nothing would ever change in our E and our I compartments. Um, we would just have susceptible dogs moving to vaccinated. That might, might not be what we're looking for. Um, so what are the processes that we left out? Infection and progression. progression. That's the word I like, yeah. Um, progression. Is that it? I guess I may, that might be it. Any other connections between our compartments that seem like they're missing? Becky? So right now you just have vaccinated that look like they're dying. If you wanted to include waning immunity, you could have another arrow taking it back 
you could, but we took out loss of immunity. As, yeah, so we took out that out as a process because they're not living long enough to lose their immunity it was the main argument there, Ani. Another question, uh, are processes additive? What do you mean? So you have some But we need we need to represent them separately because we need to know when. No, I know, but I'm conscious. Yeah, I mean, so 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 we can't. I mean, we can we can add them all up, and we can say what's happening to our overall dog population. Um, is it increasing or decreasing? If we add all the rates at which all of them are changing, um, then we get an overall like rate of change care, for our. Uh, like we don't care about the count of. Right, we don't, we don't care about the count of latent, um, but we do think that the, that the delay associated with being latent might actually be important for the dynamics. It, in, in this model, it probably would be fine to leave the EI, E out for now um, and then to put it back in. And that's something that I encourage people to do a lot is to take things out and put them back in and see how much it changes things. It's probably not going to affect our research, the answer to our research question. Still be accounted for in math if we included the ST plus EI. I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Sorry. I'm not following your suggestion. Maybe we can talk about it at coffee, and, and we can write write down some equations and try to figure out. Um, yes. Oh, Sarah. just one other simplification. Could we just put one arrow coming out of I if we're assuming that all dogs are dying in rabies? Yeah. So that's that's a that's that's a good a good question. So I like to represent them separately because I think of. Um, background mortality as coming out of all of the compartments and disease-induced mortality as being in addition to that. But you certainly could, from a mathematical point of view, it would be perfectly valid to just say, well, that arrow is both and, and just disease-induced mortality and background mortality all get lumped together. Um, there's absolutely no reason that you have to do it this way. For your comment about playing with putting the exposed class in, mm -hmm. and yep. I, I have a question about we, I'm not sure, I don't have the intuition yet to know if we see that much of a difference just in the dynamical model world, uh -huh. but overall when you're playing with that, are you, if you're playing with it to put in and out and you happen to have a data set of access to it, are you trying to make it more match the dynamics that you saw? But what's the, I can play with it for the sake of I think it's important, but I want to understand why I do that in the model world and why I'm doing that when I'm trying to solve a problem. Right, so the reason you do it is to see whether it matters. Okay, just to see if it matters. So to see if it matters. Vastly yeah. different dynamics or parameters in the end. In, in your outcome that your, your question is about what level of vaccination is necessary to eliminate dog rabies, yeah. if you have that compartment in mm -hmm. and you answer that question, then you take that compartment away and you answer that question, then say with them, with it you get 72% and without it you get 70% then you would say, it probably doesn't matter much because that level of variation, I'm going to have trouble even measuring whether I'm you know, at 72% versus 70%. Um, it, it's not having a big effect. Um, but if you've got 20% and 90%, then you would say, oh, this is a really important thing. I need to keep it in my model because it's having a big effect and I know that it's going on in the real world. Um, Unless it maybe went the other direction, it's something confusing. Right. Yeah, something. yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, there are, and we'll talk about this more over the course of the next few days, um, but there are also other reasons that you might include things even if they don't make a difference. Like um, sometimes when you're talking to a policymaker, they will think something's really important, and if it's not in your model, they just won't listen to you, and then that's a good reason to keep it in your model, especially if it's not making a difference, <laughs> um, right? Um, if you can put it in and just say, okay, well, I know it doesn't matter, but so it's making you feel better than, yeah. Okay, good. So I think we've now sufficiently um, reconciled our processes. I seem to have combined steps five and six. Um, so you can, you can do this. I guess what I usually do is I usually just sort of go through the lists and say, do I have everything I need to connect this to that? Um, I didn't do it this time. This time I went straight into constructing the diagram. So the next step is to construct a diagram that represents all of the individual characteristics and processes of interest. Um, 
but we are not really fully finished with constructing our diagram because in order to really have a full diagram, we have to have something that tells people what's going on. Um, so um, at this point, I do wanna say there's lots of different ways of constructing model diagrams. And if you read the literature, you're gonna see people using very different conventions. Um, we have a set of conventions that we like, the ICI 3D faculty, and that we're going to request that you use for tomorrow's exercise because if you don't, it's going to be very confusing for everyone. <laughs> um, so while in the real world out of MMED, you might want to sort of develop your own conventions and play with things and see how you think uh, things work well uh, and communicate things well. Um, for tomorrow, we're all going to use the same set of conventions, which is also the set of conventions I'm going to use now. Um, okay, so. I'm trying to find our list of conventions. <laughs> um, okay, so our um, conventions are that we're gonna use solid labeled arrows to represent the transitions from one category or state to another. Um, so I have solid arrows um, for all of my processes, but I haven't yet labeled them, and so we're gonna need to label them. Um, and the way we're gonna label all of our arrows into or out of a state variable or a compartment is with the total rate for that process. Um, so we need to come up with some parameter names um, to sort of help us with this. So we've got, um, let's see, we've got birth, We'll call that new to be consistent with the um, labeling that we've been using um, throughout the week. Um, so this, this will be, let's call this our birth. And um, our infection process is probably going to be, um, let's see, there's going to be a contact, um, a contact rate, a probability of infection given contact, um, and then we're going to have a, um, some proportion of those contacts that are with infected individuals, so we often represent that as I over N, that's our sort of simplest assumption, um, and then of course it's coming out of this susceptible category, um, so we're also going to multiply this by S. So let's use some shorthand here. We're going to call this the force of infection. Um, which is just the, um, the, the hazard experienced by susceptible individuals. Um, and label this lambda s. But because this is, it has an i in it, we want to be really explicit about that. And we're going to add an arrow that indicates that this process is affected not just by the, um, by the compartment that it's coming out of, because obviously you need susceptibles around in order to become infected, but also by this other compartment, the infectious individuals. Um, so our convention is that we use dashed arrows that point to the transitions um, to indicate influences of one state on the rate of transition from another state. Okay, so I'm going to put my, mute, my new here. Um, my progression, I can't remember what we've been calling that. Um, I'll, I'll just write here just for the, so it's clear. Um, what we've been calling beta is, is the product of these two things, the contact rate and the probability of infection given contact. Um, our progression, what have we been calling it? Gamma, maybe? Sigma, I think, it's, I think we've been calling it sigma. Um, so I'll label that sigma E, and I'll come over here and say sigma is the rate of progression, which is equal to one over the latent period. Does that sound familiar to everyone? Okay. Um, and then we also have our disease-induced mortality. Um, 
I'll call that alpha. So alpha times i. Um, so alpha is disease-induced mortality rate. Um, and that's equal to 1 over the mean infectious period. OK, so now we have our background mortality rate. I think we've been calling that mu. Have we been calling that mu? Um, so mu times s, and mu times e, and mu times i, and mu times v. So mu equals background mortality rate, which is equal to 1 over the life expectancy, as we've seen a couple of times. OK. Um, two more things I have to label. Importations. Um, I'll just call that epsilon for now. Um, and our vaccination. So now we have to think a little bit about what vaccination looks like in this context. So we're talking about Tanzania, um, and we're talking about vaccinating dogs. We want to reach a certain level of vaccination. We haven't really said much about what, what we mean by level of vaccination. Um, so who can tell me how dogs get vaccinated in this context? I Alan? I have no idea, but I assume <laughs> that you could have kind of two different processes. You could have sort of a basal level of vaccination where, you know, owners of dogs seek out vaccination, or you could also have like vaccination campaigns where there's ways of people coming in to the vaccine as many dogs so my impression is that in, in this context, vaccination campaigns are really the thing that, that are going to affect population level vaccination rates. There might be one or two people out there who are going to go and get their dogs vaccinated, but they're probably vets. <laughs> um, um, is that yeah. roughly accurate? Okay. Um, so I think it's, it's sort of important to think about that. So if we represent it as this continuous rate of vaccination, that's going to give us a really unrealistic picture. Whoops, unrealistic picture. It may or may not actually affect um, our research question. Um, and again, the way to know whether it affects our research question is to try it both ways. Um, but I think that because this is a really important feature of, some, of, of one of the processes that we're most concerned with, that it makes sense to try to represent it realistically and then play with whether simplifying it affects the question. Um, so there are um, a couple different ways that we could do this, but I think what I will do for, for the sake of this exercise is to say that we are going to um, have a transition here that is discontinuous in time. And so I think the way that we'll represent that for now um, is just to say it's going to be a um, some parameter, I'll call it v, little v, and um, I'll make it a function of time. So I'm going to call it v sub t. So this is going to be the rate at which individuals go from here to here, but that rate is going to be time varying. And probably the way that we actually want to represent it is something like a step function. So um, this is going to be time, and this is going to be v of t. And let's say um, there's sort of about how often, um, Thumbi, would it be realistic to have vaccination campaigns? Every year? Every annual. annual. OK, great. Um, so let's say this is one year, two years, three years. And maybe this vaccination is just going to take um, a value between 0 and 1 
and we're going to every year vaccinate some proportion of the dogs. Does that roughly make sense to people? And so our question now might be slightly modified to say, if we have annual vaccination campaigns, what level of vaccination do we have to reach in, those, in each of those campaigns in order to be able to eliminate transmission? Um, and this susceptible replenishment is, is sort of one of the reasons that, that the timing of the vaccination matters. Um, because if in the course of a year our susceptibles get back up to 100%, then we're going to have to rethink whether annual vaccination campaigns are even a thing that we can use to eliminate rabies. Okay, um, so now we have V of T, and I'm just, I'm going to write it in words, and this is fine also if you want to do this on your diagram. It's going to be um, time varying, or well, let's call it the proportion proportion successfully vaccinated. Um, so this is sort of getting at the effect of immunization. Um, the proportion successfully vaccinated in annual campaign. And this picture here helps us understand what that means. Um, so on your model diagram, if this were your question, then you could actually include a little diagram like that to help people understand what's going on. Okay. Yes, Jeanette, please do. When we go back to the question, which is what level of vaccination do you need? I feel like if we call VT uh, the proportion that's successfully vaccinated, the answer we get, we'll still have to do some additional calculations on it. Because mm -hmm. even if you vaccinate 90%, let's say 80% are successfully immunized. Right. So shouldn't we make this just the proportion of people who are vaccinated and then have something else that looks at protection being, you know, 80%? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, I think that's a totally valid point. Um, you could do it either way. And um, I think maybe the, the more mathematical perspective is, well, let's find out in our model world what it has to be, and then let's sort of try to translate that into the real world and say, well, we know that we need the, the actual effective coverage to be, say, 70%. What does, that, how, what does that mean in terms of how many we actually have to vaccinate because, given our vaccine effectiveness? Or we could do it the other way around. We could make it explicitly. We could say V sub T is equal to um, the, pro the proportion that we actually vaccinate. I'll call that P and some um, effectiveness, which we'll call F. Um, and you could put that in explicitly there. And I think, you know, for at least for rabies, things like what proportion of the ones that I jab with a needle are actually going to be immunized, I think things like that are pretty well worked out. For other diseases, they might not be. Um, but yeah, there's different ways to do, it, do that, and it, they're all fine as long as you remember to do it. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've now gone through this process together for um, a question that hopefully makes some sense to you, but, um, but is probably very different from most of your actual research questions. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, your assignment now is for tomorrow, for the 8.30 session tomorrow morning, um, to hand draw or print, if you prefer, um, a clearly labeled version of your own model diagram. So you should go through this process for your own research question. And if you're still struggling with your research question and, and, and putting it into this framework, um, come and talk to me or Becky um, or Steve or Jonathan or any of the other faculty um, at some point throughout the day and we can try to help you work through that. Um, but the goal is that by tomorrow morning, everyone's gonna come in with a clean labeled version of a model diagram um, for a model world that would help you address a specific research question. Um, so the other thing that I didn't mention is when you um, bring that in, you also need to write the research question on the same sheet of paper, um, which hopefully you will not have any trouble doing. Okay, 
So I'm going to post um, the list of steps and some instructions for some, some additional information for each of the steps. Um, and they will be available linked from the schedule, um, as well as a reminder about the conventions to use for your labeling. Um, so, but just again, the processes are solid arrows. Any influences of one state on another process is a dashed arrow. A all the arrows should be labeled and you need a key that defines your, so all of the symbols that you're using. Um, so I guess the thing that's missing here is that I haven't defined S, E, I, and V. Um, but I think we all have a pretty good sense of, of how we would do that. Okay, so it's now 9.44, so you have from now until the coffee break to start working through this process for yourselves. And um, don't forget throughout the day that you need to be working on it so that you end up tomorrow morning with a, um, with a diagram that's ready to go. Any questions before we start? I will post this example. Yeah, it'll take me a few minutes um, to, to put it into my computer, um, but I will also post this example. Yes, thanks. Good.